Good day, everybody. Uh, hello, I'm David Nabarro, and I welcome you to today's open online briefing about the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, I just want to say that we've done some changes this time to our way of working because we had some unexpected participants in previous webinars. Uh, and I'm anticipating that this may lead to a smaller number of participants today uh, because uh, that we've had to introduce a password function. We're doing our best to find ways to connect with you all that reduce the, the number of people who are kind of trying to spoil what we're doing. And uh, we, but we're still going to continue with this series of open online briefings uh, in the hope of uh, providing up-to-date information that's useful to everyone. Now, I'd like to give you uh, my quick update, update on the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. I'd also like to offer some, uh, some particular things that I'm focusing on and uh, look ahead to where I think we're going to go. And uh, first of all, I really want to start by hoping that you are all safe and well. Uh, and that you are, if you are unwell, with, particularly with COVID, that you are looking after yourselves uh, and in the knowledge that we still believe that the majority of people who have COVID have some unpleasant symptoms but don't need hospital care. If you're a health worker, I send you my warm, warm wishes and incredible gratitude for what you're doing. Uh, I, I actually do understand how challenging it is. And some health workers are in uh, expanded units or special testing centers that have been set up and are finding that at the moment they don't have many people to, to respond to. And that's because of the way in which this pandemic works. It doesn't go everywhere and affect everybody in a community. It starts with very small outbreaks, perhaps one person who's come into an area uh, infecting a few others and then a small chain of transmission developing. And at that very early stage, the chain can be interrupted. And the issue is how to prevent these small chains from getting in, into becoming big, big spreading outbreaks with all sorts of impacts. And we're seeing now that you really can do that by interrupting transmission through isolating people. It helps if you can test them. And that's happening in, in many, many countries now, in Singapore, South Korea, Germany. Uh, and then secondly, you can go one step further and really reduce the amount of contacts that people have by having physical distancing measures in a community or lockdown. And as I said yesterday, there's an awful lot of people in the world living under lockdown. But it is my perception that the, that the in, uh, imposition of these lockdowns really is reducing uh, the transmission intensity and slowing the rate at which the uh, outbreaks are expanding in many different parts of the world. Uh, and that's just a very, very good thing. It's, people are sacrificing, but they're sacrificing and there are results starting to come through. Those who've got COVID now uh, seem to have many fewer contacts to report in the last few days than people who were diagnosed two weeks ago. And there's just some suggestion that the very big numbers that are being expected in hospitals are not coming through at quite the rate that was thought. At least that's the early signs. It's far, far too early to say that the curve is flattening. It's too early to say that the corner has been turned. But there's a feeling that I have that, as I say, that there are some shifts occurring. And so although there's still a huge battle in Italy and in Spain. And although there are parts of the UK with growing numbers, parts of the US with very, very serious problems, I don't want everybody to feel that this is just going to go on forever and we're going to be in lockdown forever. That I think is not going to be the case. But I do think it's still going to be some time, say, in many parts of the world. Uh, that we have turned the corner. It's rather a case of saying, keep it up. Um, let me just give you, I mean, the numbers uh, are, of course, disturbing. I've said many times that this is a uh, pandemic where 
we've got cases doubling um, every numbers of cases doubling every three days. But um, what I'm hearing also is that there are reports of cases coming increasing again in parts of South Korea and increasing again in parts of China, showing that every country has to be vigilant and on the defense against the return of the virus. Uh, it's not once you push down one of these big outbreaks, it doesn't automatically go away. And yes, there are reports of increased numbers coming up in, in some of the poorer parts of the world with a total number of counted cases, more than a million. So my priorities for the moment are the following. I think that the challenges faced in wealthy nations are really big and the problems being faced by people in Europe and the United States and Japan, uh, South Korea, all um, wealthy nations are, are really serious. But I spend most of my time thinking about poorer countries and crowded settings in poorer countries where the health service resources are so limited and the opportunities for people to isolate if they've got symptoms of the disease are much less. And I get many people now asking me, what about those living in favelas in the Sao Paulo or in the townships in South Africa or in urban concentrations in India? What are the prospects for enabling people to isolate? What are the prospects for uh, the hand washing and other instructions to be followed. And of course, I know and all of you know that it's really so, so hard to follow the instructions in low budget settings. And, and it does really point to the importance of handing over, thinking through how to deal with chains of transmission to local communities and saying to them and to their leaders, how would you go about this in a way that helps ensure that people are not neglected and isolated, but also ensures that they are, if they are infected, that they are less likely to transmit to others. And so it's that spirit of really encouraging community solidarity and strong honeycombs of organization in communities with big support functions being practiced and good quality public health enumeration of who's ill and who's well. That spirit's the one that I'm trying to encourage wherever possible. And then I see Tedros, the WHO Director General, uh, who is uh, the person who's giving us direction on what to do. I see Tedros encouraging us to really focus on solidarity at community level in poor communities in particular. Now, at the same time, we're seeing in poor communities a huge, huge problem as a result of the lockdowns, really preventing people who are on daily wages to get employment. We're also hearing examples of uh, the necessity for physical means to be used to limit uh, any kind of disturbance in the street. We had a report from South Africa yesterday, for example. And so really tackling the incredible difficulties that populations have during these lockdowns uh, really is something that is on, on our minds a lot. And, and it's something where we need to constantly be alert to the, the challenging juggling that authorities have to do. On the one hand, there's a lockdown and the lockdown is important and you cannot, cannot, cannot get on top of these outbreaks without putting the COVID ready state with all the defenses in the community and then doing some early uh, physical distancing just to make sure that everything is in place. And um, this, this can be very powerful in stopping the buildup of big outbreaks, but it is extremely difficult for people. And I think everybody is understanding this in all nations and all the time appealing to both the authorities to be sensitive, but also to the people as a whole to understand that this is absolutely essential to prevent the buildup of very big outbreaks. So that is my preoccupation number one. And I'm really interested to hear from people who've got examples of ways in which poor communities are 
both protecting themselves and also looking after the well-being of others. Second preoccupation is, is about health workers. Uh, I have been really quite, kind of concerned that, that there are so many health workers, for example, in Italy, who've got ill in trying to deal with very large numbers of COVID patients coming into hospitals. I, I think it's pretty clear that when you've got a, a lot of people with a, a nasty infectious disease descending on a health facility, it's very easy for health workers not to be able to protect themselves just because of the absolute volume of virus that they're in contact with every day. We saw this with Ebola, that when things are really stressed and you're working really hard, you know, little gaps appear in your personal protective equipment. If the mask doesn't fit on to the uh, the overall uh, helmet well, or if the visor doesn't have a complete seal between the visor and the helmet, it's so easy for droplets to get through. And so protecting and supporting and empowering health workers everywhere, because they're in the front line on the struggle, seems to me to be constantly important. And when I hear reports that a health worker in a apartment block in France has had notices put through her door saying, we don't want you here, get out. That really disturbs me. When I hear reports of health workers being attacked in some countries, I'm not wishing to name, uh, because they're thought to be somehow linked to the virus, again, I get very upset. And I feel that anything we can do to protect, to support and to empower health workers and really to hope that through this pandemic, we will see greater respect given to health workers, about 70% of whom are women, and many of whom are very low paid, then I shall feel a bit relieved. But right now, I've got a sort of sadness in my heart about the challenges being faced by health workers and their occasional confusion about how they should protect themselves and how they can look after their loved ones at home who are also struggling. My third preoccupation is about shortages. And, and I'm, I do understand why there are shortages. And, and I think we're all involved. How many of us have got worried that certain items are going to run out? And so we go out to the shops, perhaps buying food or buying medicines, and we just want to keep a little stock. But if just about everybody wants to keep a little extra stock, and if just about every shop wants to hold back a little stock, and every hospital wants to keep a bit of extra stock, and every local government unit wants to keep a bit of extra stock, and every country wants to build up their stock, that has the most amazing impact on supply, especially as from certain items at the moment, in the language of supply and demand, the, su the supply side is a bit tight. And that applies, uh, sorry, and the demand side is very high. And so that applies to virus tests, that applies to personal protective equipment, it applies to masks, it applies to ventilators, and it applies to oxygen and medicines, and then it applies to food. That the fact is that food is being withheld in various places and prices are going up. We have reports from, not so much from European and North American markets, but we do hear it from India and from Africa. So I am obviously focused on shortages. Now, how can you deal with these shortages? One is to increase production. Two is to have some kind of control over the, where the supplies are going. Three is to establish independent distribution systems. And of course, for food, that's been done for years. And we have a whole system called the World Food Programme, which is on high alert to deal with the possibilities of hunger and food shortage in different areas. But in, on the health supplies, we have a system, but honestly, it is overwhelmed. And we're adding in extra issues to this system, such as coronavirus testing kits. And they're in an exchange with some of the manufacturers trying to find out what the options are. And also things like soap and hygiene products, where there's a lot of, of good stuff coming on the market, some of it free, but getting the distribution system in place is difficult. And I'm so excited to hear of some really, really good initiatives where new finance is coming in, new factory capacity is being built, new uh, ordering and distribution systems are being set up, and then uh, a, a, a market responsive, uh, a responsive mechanism is in place for protective equipment in some parts of the world that will just help to deal with 
some of the terrible log jams. It's all got to be done super fast and there are global shortages. I've got another preoccupation, uh, which i will finish in a minute my opening remarks, another preoccupation which is about really the way in which the world is, is managing this emergency. I've mentioned it to you before, but my thinking has really advanced just given the, the, the challenges associated with the lockdowns and the fact that I think that coming out of the lockdowns into what I'm calling the COVID ready state, which will be in place for many months, this is going to need international cooperation. Otherwise, re-establishing the whole travel industry and even movements within countries is going to be difficult, let alone movements between countries. And that reason for that is there's going to be a lot of suspicion of travelers and questions about where they're coming from. And there may well be all sorts of extra things like a local quarantine when you arrive in a place being imposed so that to be sure that you're free of disease, requirements to show that perhaps you have had the disease and therefore have some degree of immunity, in brackets, we don't know how much immunity you have, but all these kinds of things will set up. And, and I think what we're thinking about is that there will almost certainly be some restrictions on movements, even within countries, if there's one part of a country that's known to have a lot of transmission underway, others that are not, there'll be, there'll be questions being asked. And we're already seeing that happening as countries think about uh, releasing their lockdown. So the whole process of lockdown release, and indeed the whole process of managing uh, the, the shift and transition from intense outbreaks uh, in some parts of the world to settling things down, it's not going to be easy. So I'm really focused now on what I call solidarity within countries between different uh, local administrations and solidarity between countries. And, and I'm very hopeful that uh, the whole of the UN, the World Health Organization, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank can help the world deal with some of these problems because that's what, frankly, these system, uh, United Nations systems institutions are designed to do. And today I'm going to release a proposal for a, a council to be formed by the leaders of these organizations supported by the G20, supported by uh, business networks, civil society networks, and networks of professionals and trades unionists to make certain that there is a single focal point for leadership, plus connection to the groups, the international groups that bring different actors together. It's the same spirit as we had when the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development was agreed as the plan for the future of the world and her people. And it's the same spirit that we had for the Paris Climate Agreement. And whilst we may not necessarily have the same global leadership, never was there a greater need for solidarity than now. And my last point is just a little bit about how we're all working. And now, we do know that this pandemic is accelerating fast. And although I see some green shoots of, of slowing down in some markets, I don't actually think that we are at the point where, as I say, the, the curve has been bent. But, you know, how are we going to work as a community? Answer, we're still dealing with a problem which is shifting in how we see it very fast. We still need to try to find better ways to align our thinking and our mindsets so that together we can shift and we can jump ahead of the pandemic and be alert to its consequences and anticipating the future. That's what the team that I work with uh, has been trying to do. And it requires a, a what we call a living systems mentality where you're thinking about the way systems are interacting in society humans as part of these systems, and you're also trying to develop ways of working with other people's perspectives, meeting them where they are, and building relationships that are based on a common identity and a sense of trust so that you share and so that you, uh, try, so that you constantly focus on the relationships you have with each other to keep that trust going. And I'm working really hard on networks 
that can make these kinds of connections and shifts in many locations. And I'm trying to link up with others through our organization 4SD. We're going to be doing that more and more and more. Avoiding any transactional processes with lots of approval steps that delay us and discarding our usual need to be visible and to be recognized. Now, when we work like this, we will no doubt do things that others later will say we got wrong. And there's a lot of blame going on. And the way I'm saying, what I'm saying to people about that is, okay, but we are in the middle of an epic struggle. And if we waste a lot of time on blame, then that detracts us from what we're trying to do. Of course, we're all accountable. And of course, we will need to be called to account. And the what we must do now is to learn lessons and apply those lessons as we move forward. What we can do later is to be called to account, asked to account, render our accounts, and accept whatever blame is necessary. And there will be blame. But that form of accountability is how it will be and how it should be. Okay, so now I'm going to look at some of the questions uh, and comments. Thank you so much for, for, do it, for being with us and thank you so much for not being too, well, for, you can't be upset, uh, for, for <laughs> acknowledging that we're having to do things differently. It's only because the uh, Zoom bombers really, uh, they bomb me. I don't think you necessarily saw them bombing, but they do make it quite difficult for us to manage an open briefing like this if they're putting a, a peculiar images onto uh, our, our feed all the time and filling the chat with obscenities. So I first, um, why, first question, why is WHO spending time and energy um, denying that the virus is airborne? This might be important for healthcare workers, but it does confuse the general public if it's being said by scientists that it can stay in the air for three hours. Now, what the World Health Organization is trying to do all the time is to give uh, people information based on what's known so that they can make judgments themselves about risk. And because handling this particular pathogen all the time requires us to judge and all the time requires risk assessments. And so the position that we've said for all um, respiratory pathogens uh, that are carried in respiratory secretions is that the primary mode of transmission is through droplets. So when you cough or when you speak or when you sneeze, tiny, tiny droplets, they really are microscopic, come out of your mouth and they spread for about a meter and a half maximum. And then uh, if you are beyond that meter and a half, you are safe. Now, there is always going to be a very small proportion of virus particles that don't stay inside droplets that or can go into the air either as virus on their own or in micro attached to microscopic particles of water. And that can then be carried by the air and it can go beyond the, the two meter marker. But that's not universal. That is as far as we can tell, and I'm just all the time basing myself on this assessment of evidence, as far as we can tell, that seems to be a, a much less important mode of transmission. In certain settings, particularly in very in unventilated environments, that limited amount of airborne virus can be quite important and we've seen in in cruise liners and so on that may be relevant but the main main mode of transmission is droplet borne not airborne i think if the world health organization felt that airborne was a major mode of transmission they would certainly say it and i would certainly say it as a public health person but i'm just trying to give you the balance and 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 if the if the general position changes then of course the World Health Organization will change. I actually reviewed modes of transmission the other day. Let me just add that although virus particles are found in feces, it's not thought that fecal oral transmission is a mode of transmission. Or, and 
particles of virus in droplets do rest on surfaces. Uh, we again don't know for how long they stay infectious. So that does mean cleaning surfaces and hand washing is so important. But uh, I hope that that's a, a, a clear statement. And I'm going to really continue to say to you, what I share with you is what I know. And when I am not sure about things, I'll tell you. And when I think that there is a balance being struck so that we've got an adequate information on which to assess our own risks, I will tell you. Question two. In Africa, we have to stress the issue of cross-border and the quarantine system to be in place. Uh, food security and sanitary equipment will be a major cause of concern. Social distancing in Africa is questionable because of culture and other tribal practices. What is your advice to community and religious leaders on this? I want to start with the second part. I want to go back to 2014 in West Africa and Ebola, talking to religious leaders about funeral practices and listening to them saying how important it was in the funerals that they were organizing, that they're, especially if it was an important person, that the body was open, the casket was open, and that people would touch the body and in fact get very close to the body in order to make certain that the spirits were properly appeased and that the soul would go to a good place and not be in a bad place that would endanger the well-being of everybody in the community. In so many societies, this importance of the funeral to be a good way to settle a soul is inside deeply held traditions to the point where in West Africa, people would hide bodies of dead people away from the authorities so they could give them a traditional funeral uh, and not be told, sorry, you've got to go through the, what we call safe and dignified burial system because that is necessary to reduce the spread of disease. The only way we can help local communities to deal with this physical distancing is to explain to them why we propose it and to invite them to come out with solutions using their basic systems for managing threats and disease. And although it will not always lead to precisely what we think is right, although sometimes there will be situations where transmission continues to occur, I do believe that offering the problem to others and saying you solve it using your logic is the only way to do it. And we were guided to do this, not by public health people, but by anthropologists, particularly anthropologists from the region, who just explained how it had to be done and stressed that when you're doing the dialogue at the beginning, don't turn up in six big land cruisers with all your uniform on of your different organizations. That looks like military or, or some kind of authority to local people and they get scared. You've got to come along on the back of a motorbike uh, wearing ordinary clothing and not with a load of security guards if you can help it and just talk to people straight up. I mean, it's totally difficult getting these things right, but I'm so convinced that that's the only way to do it. Now, there are many countries who've decided that the right way to keep their people safe is to, is to ban in, uh, people crossing borders. And there's no doubt that that, that can, is, it's a logical thing to do, and it may well be super important, given that in a lot of places, the virus comes in from outside your community. But honestly, you can't put up barriers to the virus simply by stopping everybody to travel. Uh, we've seen in so many countries in Europe and the US that still the virus comes. So I'm trying to say, you know, if you want to control where, where the people are coming in, you probably have to resort to what's being done now in some Asian countries of actually saying, okay, come, but we have to put you into quarantine for perhaps a week or two weeks, depending on the local rules, and then you can enter our country. Some system like that may well be necessary. But most importantly, the, the issue, it, the virus is, we believe, carried in people. It's not carried in goods. It's not carried in vegetables. It's not carried in packets of medicines. It's, and, and it's so really, really important that we're clear about that. And so there should be, in my view, no reason to have big pileups of goods at borders 
because of COVID. You could possibly be asking the drivers to change and to leave the truck somewhere. One driver is one side of the border and another driver comes to pick the truck up. And you can also, of course, if you really feel you need to, do some, a lot of cleaning. But remember, this virus doesn't last for long on surfaces, so you can leave the vehicle for a few hours and then it should be safe. But of course, it'd be the right thing to wipe down the steering wheel and all that stuff. But I'm, I'm quite uh, uh, surprised that there are, according to my reports I've heard, massive queues of trucks at borders because of this. Now, I'm gonna, gonna have a question now uh, on, by the way, I do hope that this style of answering is okay to you. You can always use the chat line if you feel that you don't, you need more. And, and we will, on the basis of some of these questions, also put some of the issues you raise into our narratives. And Twee, uh, my colleague who's doing such a splendid job on managing the chat line, will make sure you know where the narratives are. They're on, I think you probably know, they're on the website where we announce these open online briefings. Next question, number three. What role can higher education play? For me, higher education is so, so important for the following reasons. Number one, students are now, in many cases, not in their universities, not going to classes. Students can be working with their local communities and making certain that people have all the information that's available about this. But most importantly, because all, all many of the decisions we are making about how we change our own behavior or how we work with the public health authorities, how we support health workers, how we work to keep vital sectors of the economy going. Most of these, most of these involve judgments. Judgments based on our assessment of risk, judgments based on our understanding of, of how to manage outbreaks, judgments based on what's going on in the local environment, because each setting is different. So it's a really fascinating and complex challenge to link together the principles of public health uh, when we have some understanding of what's risky and what's not risky, an understanding of the disease inside our communities and an appreciation of the, of the environment. Now, I believe that people in higher education can do a fabulous job just connecting the different groups of actors in the community, encouraging dialogue, weaving together some of the ideas, sharing what's known from the science through looking at what's on websites, trying to, to tell people what they perceive to be disinformation, what they perceive to be information, helping to interpret government advice, and more generally, uh, working with communities so that they are stronger. The second thing, of course, is the important role of higher education in maintaining a capacity among students to continue learning and working, even though the universities have, have uh, disbanded in some cases. And thirdly, in doing research, not just research on the biomedical science, which is of course what gets in the newspapers, but research on how it is best for communities to work together, how it is best for authorities and communities to interact with each other, how it is best for communities to establish a way to defend themselves against the virus. I've got a question here saying, are we listening to the true leaders? Uh, I divide that into two parts. Who are the true leaders and what does listening really mean? The true leaders in an issue of this kind are the leaders who are able to deal with complexity, able to deal with multiple interacting processes at the same time, not scared of having to cope with challenging trade-offs, ready to shift position when there's evidence they've got to do so. They are everywhere. And I, I really would like to encourage a, a much, uh, a, a broad understanding of, of leadership. And when it comes to listening, yes, we can listen to what people are saying on the, on the, on the media. But what I'm really asking myself all the time is are we actually taking on board what we're hearing and applying it in our own settings and feeding back to them? For me, the leader on this issue is Tedros, the Director General of WHO. It's because there, this is a, a, a pandemic and it requires an understanding of what the virus is doing. 
and we have to get ahead of the virus and anticipate where it might going, might be going. And so Tedros is leading a team of, for me, the most extraordinary people, and uh, he is the leader. But this is not just a, a medical issue. It's an issue of society, of economy, of livelihoods, where human rights in some cases are not necessarily being recognized. It's an absolute tragedy in poor communities. It could unravel development gains over the last decade. And it's particularly challenging in refugee settings. It's really important that we also have a leader who can understand the challenges of, of inequity and how that's playing through. And in some cases, inequities will be exacerbated, especially as some freedoms may also be curtailed. So that's why I see this combination of Tedros as the leader of the health community on the pandemic and the Secretary General of the United Nations as the person who leads the organizations whose charter begins, we the peoples of the world. The United Nations is the organization for all people. And of course, then he needs to link up with the big economic organizations, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And they don't need to be there to help. But for me, the combination of Tedros and the Secretary General of the United Nations, very strongly supported by my former colleague when I was in the UN, Amina Mohammed, the Deputy Secretary General, who's been so important in bringing the whole UN system together. For me, they're the leaders, and I wish that the world could be giving just a little bit more space to these people just during this emergency. Fifth question. Can I get coronavirus if I use a towel, a hand towel that was used by an infected person? This is thinking of families. So, of course, within families, if one person has symptoms, uh, it's quite challenging, especially if the accommodation is small, for that person with symptoms to be able to live separately from the rest. A colleague who I work, with whom I work closely described how her husband has symptoms and is in a, a room on his own with his own bathroom facilities. Food is put outside the door. Uh, he comes out, picks up the food. So there is isolation done inside the house. But they're fortunate, as, as they tell me, that they have the capacity to do this. Many, many, many others don't and so they will be living much closer. Now, I would suggest, if that's the case, just try to reduce by, when you do have symptoms, if you really, if you've decided that your people you're living with don't want to get infected for any reason, then it's useful to wear a mask. Because when, if you've got the symptoms, a mask does reduce the distance that your droplets spread. Uh, if you've got an opportunity, do use separate washing facilities. If you have to use the same washing space, then of course, try to use separate towels and try, if you can, to sleep in a separate place. That's just best practice. That's risk reduction. Because yes, the virus can stay on cloth that people have used. And there are different understandings. It does look as though the capacity of the virus to reside on certain types of material is shorter than other. I'm never quite sure exactly how much to give that because in my experience, having studied these, you know, it all depends on the droplet size. It all depends on how much virus is in the saliva. People secrete much, much more virus at the beginning of their coronavirus illness than once it's established. And so I think I would try to separate things like towels if at all possible. And I would try to have a mask if at all possible. Now, I want to talk a little bit because I've got a question here on, on the whole food system. I've been working with a number of colleagues uh, who, are working, who are involved in food. And we have to remember that food systems are quite often quite long things where you've got food produced in one place and then taken to a, a, a place where it's either processed or at least managed and then they're, they're, then that's given to distributors and then it comes into places where it's marketed be they 
shops or, or open markets. And there are lots of steps on the chain. And there's plenty of opportunities for things to go wrong on food supply chains. At the moment, I'm told that global stocks of key grains like rice, like wheat, like maize are pretty good. We're not in a situation where stocks are short, and that's a very important starting point. In fact, uh, until recently, the prices of the key commodities, excuse me, <coughs> the prices of commodities were low. And so that means that, you know, we're not dealing with a, a kind of global shortage situation. But I mentioned this bit about people just stockpiling a bit like what we do when there's trouble. We're anticipating there may be a shortage. And so there are people keeping stocks in their families, in the local shops, in the local authority areas, in the nations. And some nations are doing quite strong what we call export bans, which means they normally export food, but they're saying no more exports. And so these kinds of behaviors, which are utterly rational, do lead to prices going up. And the people who are most affected by rising prices are of course people who are poorest in society. And the people who are poorest in societies are being hit hardest by the lockdowns. So that's why I am advocating for shortest possible lockdown, which means maximum possible effort on the pandemic. So yes, the pandemic and the lockdowns and food are linked and we've got to get them all right. But we do need to look at, so that's the big system picture, but we do need to look at the, in the challenges in individual places. And the problem of food prices going up is starting to happen. I've heard that members of parliament, this has come from one of you, in New Zealand are asking the public to take photos that show whether or not prices are going up. Uh, what are my thoughts on retailers doing this and on the reporting system? I just think that we have to be very, very clear that any effort to profiteer from this situation is really unacceptable. And anything that can be done to, to call attention to people who are profiteering uh, um, really need to be, uh, anybody who's, who's, who's we, we need to draw attention to this profiteering through whatever means is possible. I think we need to understand, that, and I do hope that we don't end up in a situation where this calling out retailers with higher prices leads to any kind of action against those retailers. There's a real possibility this could backfire. And so I, I, would, I would really like there to be dialogue at local level with the retailers, with representatives of the public, to inquire as to the reasons to try to resolve without the heightening of tensions and violence. And, I, and there's such a, a narrow line between this kind of public uh, reporting and provocation of civil unrest versus this kind of reporting and stimulation of dialogue and peaceful resolution. Everybody is going to need to use whatever techniques they can to encourage peaceful resolution of conflicts which will arise as a result of the tensions associated with lockdowns. And again, back to why I'm about efforts to bring uh, the outbreaks down and to get them under some degree of containment as quickly as possible all over the world, and to set up defenses against the COVID virus that are humane and respect human rights. I want that done to reduce the duration of lockdowns and to reduce the option for this kind of problem to happen and rioting and other forms of horrid unrest to develop. Um, I'm, and now I want to go to another lockdown question, number seven. How can the impact of lockdowns be softened? Do we need to choose between restarting the economy and saving lives? Actually, I do think that in various different ways, in multiple different locations, it does feel to politicians as though that is the kind of choice, lives versus livelihoods. And uh, of course, if you look at it starkly, that's what it is. But if you dissect the issue, you start to see, well, 
actually it's all linked, it's interconnected. It's not an either or, it's a both and. But then when it's a both and, it's how do we do both and? How do we do both lives and livelihoods in ways that reduce the numbers of lives lost, but at the same time protect livelihoods as much as possible? And then we can add a third part and come out of this with a world that's safer and more equitable. So what some people call the win-win-win. And uh, so I'm saying what we need to do is to think very hard. How are we doing the public health? Have we got it right? Have we put in place the right defences at the community level? Is there solidarity at community level? And that's such an important part of the whole detect people who are infected, enable them to be isolated, support them in their isolation, find their contacts, quarantine their contacts. Keeping going with that mantra of it's all about what happens in the community and the defence systems that are put in place really, really matters to me. And I keep, keep arguing for it, especially in places where there are very intense outbreaks going on and people are scared, like in different parts of the US. Secondly, I say, if you've got a lockdown, think all the time about the people in that lockdown who are making the greatest sacrifices. Don't see this as an opportunity for social control, for the sticks and the guns to come out. It's not like that. And I know that it feels like that. And I know that it's been, some of these lockdowns were started in a very sudden way. And that was a, 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 obviously a rational thing to do because you warn people of a lockdown. What we've seen in Europe is people immediately get in their cars and drive to their country homes and spread the virus everywhere. So of course I understand why these things are imposed suddenly, but they've got to be done in a, in a careful way. We, we, my colleagues and I wrote a note actually about lockdowns, which we posted uh, yesterday, I think yesterday, you lose track of the days. And uh, I don't think that we've got the answer. I don't think anybody's got the answer. These are really massively difficult political choices. And, and you know, I do keep saying, well, perhaps the choices wouldn't have to be so bad if we all had better defenses, if we were all able in the sort of Singapore situation. Yeah. But you know, it's no good doing that. It's no good saying it could have been different. Though I sometimes do. What we have to say is, we, this is where we're at. These are the issues we've got. How can we do it best? So I think it has to be both and. And I think we have to transition to a better state. But I do know, oh gosh, I'm feeling it. I tell you, I'm feeling it, feeling it, feeling it. Because I've seen in other crises how that can trigger an exacerbation of divisions in society. So we come to question eight. What's the COVID ready state going to be like? I think that to come out of these big outbreaks and to be in a situation where we're able then to defend societies against the virus, to reduce it having this terrible impact where it overloads health systems, endangers health workers and kills an awful lot of people. We recognize that we have to be ready for COVID for the foreseeable future. Some people say, well, it's only till we have a vaccine. I'm being a little cautious and I'm saying if we have a vaccine, because I don't think we should take anything for granted. There's no, uh, no sort of alchemy about making vaccines. Excuse me. A lot of it is about luck. And a lot of it is about characteristics of the organism. You know, we've been struggling for ages to find a really good malaria vaccine. Scientists have, and it, it hasn't appeared yet. And the uh, vaccine against HIV, very tricky. So not every virus is easy to develop a vaccine against. Or parasite, as say, malaria being a parasite. <coughs> so what about this? Well, the answer is we should plan for the foreseeable future to be, have a society living with COVID in its midst. There's going, to be one, there's going to be one big question. Do people who've had COVID then develop some kind of lifelong immunity? Or do they even have an immunity against further infections short term? Or is there actually no immunity? We don't know. We do know that people who've had COVID 
have antibodies in their blood. But we don't know whether those antibodies are sufficiently strong to protect against reinfection. And if they do, for how long that protection lasts. I saw some people saying, oh, well, I want to get COVID so that I'm protected. So I'm like a kind of super person who can go around and not worry about kissing people because I won't get the virus and I won't give the virus to everyone else. I'm a kind of special one. And yeah, there are some people who are saying, perhaps there will be a division of the world into people who've got antibodies and people who haven't. And I'm sure that kind of scenario is being talked about. For me, it's not just about the individuals, it's about whether society is ready and prepared to identify people with COVID quickly, to make sure they're isolated quickly, and then to help the rest of society go on around them. We've had to do this before with other infectious diseases. We had to do it with Ebola during the latter part of the West Africa Ebola outbreak. We have to do it with cholera. Cholera is incredibly easily spread, and you have to be very, very careful when there is cholera in a community to respond rapidly. I remember in Haiti having an absolutely uh, cast iron indicator that every report of cholera, the response had to be there within a day. And that wasn't straightforward all the time. So that kind of readiness and ability to react quickly, an alert and response system in every society is going to have to be there. And it won't feel nice for the people who report their symptoms and some will try to hide them. And that's going to be a problem. And it'd be challenging if it turns out that there are a lot of people who can transmit the virus without symptoms. So quite a lot of work will need to be done based on evidence on actually how to implement those defenses. And then quite a lot of work will have to be done on determining whether a person may or may not move from one part of a country to another, depending on what the circulation of COVID is in these two different regions. And so the COVID ready steady state will take a bit of time to work out, but it'll be about living with COVID in our midst and being able to have social interactions and economic behavior with COVID in our midst. And I keep saying to people, it's not impossible. Look at what's happening in South Korea. Look at countries in Europe that have implemented only lockdowns in some areas and not in others, really to try to stop the virus spreading out of places where people know it is. And these sorts of tactics can be incredibly useful because we do know this virus moves with people. Question nine, how can we support people to maintain, I look sideways because we've got a very lovely system here going, Laurence is taking in your questions and then feeding them to me in a beautiful system. And thank you to all the team who are harvesting comments and questions and sharing. Love it. How can we support people to maintain physical distancing if they can't look after themselves and their family. So in our family, my own, uh, we have somebody who is physically disabled and we have friends, including people who've been on our 4ST leadership programs who have varying degrees of physical ability and disability, which means that their ability to look after themselves and their families is restricted. And of course, they need up close and personal support. And physical distancing is just impossible. And so handling COVID in that setting is a constant challenge. I'm asking all organizations who support people with different abilities to come together and share experiences. But in real life, the carers, have to accept that they're at risk. And in real life, the disabled or physically uh, limited person has to accept that their carers are potentially going to bring virus. And it puts a particular onus on the carers. In many parts of the world, there are reports of older people in residential homes getting virus and suffering. And this is a particular problem in certain regions, you will have read it in the media. And so this pushes, puts a very interesting responsibility on care personnel because they themselves have to be super careful about their own social interactions, about whether they're bringing the virus into the place where they're providing care. 
It's back all the time to us thinking through what we know about risk and applying it in our own settings and recognizing that these instructions that have been given by people like myself uh, are just have to, we have to recognize that they're not university, the universal questions. Here's a set of questions here about trust. And this might be getting towards the end. We've got four minutes left. I'll try and do this in two minutes. How can we build trust in government messages if people fear corruption and face violence? And what are the trends in the response about human rights and civic space? Everybody, there are no simple answers to the massive challenges that the world faces, especially when we have to consider inequities and we have to consider that rights violations are occurring against people who don't have so much power or assets. And we have to appreciate that when a crisis of this magnitude comes along with the need for actually trying to shift the behavior of vast numbers of people, billions of people, very quickly in ways that are going to cause them hardship. We have to recognize that inside this whole shift, this whole force field that is encouraging behavior change, there are going to be multiple, multiple instances of disempowerment, of exploitation, of rights violations. It's just the way things are. And it's not something that I think I want to be, feel joyful about, but we are a human system or multiple systems, I should say. And we have to recognize that the way in which these systems behave are massively influenced by power relations. So I think the most important requirement is for anybody who is communicating to be authentic. That doesn't mean being kind of making remarks to say, I know how poor people are hurting, but saying it in words that imply it's just said for the sake of saying it, but actually finding in their connections by actually feeling as much as they can some of the pain and hardship that's going on to incorporate into communication a real recognition for the struggles and for the pain of the people who are being uh, um, um, on, the, on the bad end of corruption and violence, but at the same time an exhortation to those who are exercising authority to do it in ways that take account of the struggles and the sacrifices that poor people are making for the good of the whole world, because that's what it is in the epic struggle. And to my last question in less than a minute, with the increase in numbers of cases, what if efforts are planned to address shortages of PPP and ventilators for protecting and saving health workers and infected people? Answer, there is a huge amount of effort underway from governments, businesses, financial institutions, and the health systems everywhere to repurpose manufacturing in multiple locations to produce more PPE, ventilators and masks. And I suspect a big surge in supply. There may be such a surge of supply that there will be uh, lots of excess in certain places and lack in other places. So the challenge for all of us is to try to make sure that the supply side and the demand side and then the clearing in the middle are properly linked. And there, that is something I'm trying to work on and we, I think, I think it will come. So, what to say? I use terms like epic struggle. I use term, terms about how this is a world issue, because I believe it is. Like all of you, my mood about things goes up and down. But I am convinced that through our networks, through our solidarity, through tackling these horrendous challenges together, working them through, we become better people. I don't, have, I don't have simple answers to the many points you raised, but I do believe it is through dialogue, solidarity, and weaving of ideas that we and others become stronger. Very, very delighted you joined us. Thanks to the team for everything that's been done and big, big respect to health workers everywhere. 
both those that are at the front line, as it's called, those who support them, and the essential personnel who keep our food, our security, and the systems of life going. Bye-bye all.